after all. Did you make contact with Aaron? Were you taken to another planet, to a mothership? How did they communicate with them? Can you tell me what they look like? Can you tell me how many of them there were? Were you, were you given food? But the teachers are alive. They're not books. They are the very living essences of nature itself. What a strange person. Unbelievably powerful supercomputer that's running our reality, and we don't have a clue yeah. as to how to operate it. So when maybe you or somebody else creates an AGI system, and you get to ask her one question, what would that question be? outside the simulation. Say in your mind, say to yourself, I am more than my physical body because I am more than physical matter. I can perceive that which is greater than the physical world. Broadcasting from a shack on a hill in the Mossy Creek bottoms of Cane Creek, Arkansas. This is Lighting the Void, and I'm your host, Joe Roop. It's Tuesday night, May the 5th. And tonight, we welcome back researcher, analyst, cosmologist, Laird Granton. He's got many names in my book. Probably wouldn't agree with all of them, but uh, they're all good. And Laird has uh, really done a lot of good things for us. If you guys remember all the way back when uh, the late John Anthony West was doing his research, Laird Scranton was one of those people that he went to for reference, a very good friend and someone to depend on. And uh, Laird has done quite a bit of research when it comes to uh, our origins, when it comes to the Dogon. And I've got his new book here, Ganesha, The Scientific Symbolism of a Hindu God, which um, is pretty interesting stuff if you're into science and spirituality and trying to put the two together. So we're going to welcome back Laird here in just a moment. I do want to give all the shout outs to uh, the patrons because I promised you I would. I mean, that's part of being a patron of the show, right? If you sign up for uh, Patreon, you go to patreon.com forward slash LTV radio, uh, then you can become one. And we get to do some cool stuff. I put a lot of goofy videos in there too. So there's all kinds of stuff in there. There's the... Uh, the Astral Journal, the live Ask Me Anything stuff. There's also um, my personal like audio journal where I just basically walk around the property with a with my phone and talk into it and just speak cra- like crazy on my, what's on my mind and let it, let it fly a little bit more, like a little bit more personal. Uh, but, yeah, I do want to thank Brandon, uh, Corin, Dave, Kathleen, Lynn, Macon, Malorcus, Teresa, and Tom. Thank you guys for signing up. I really do appreciate it. We couldn't do this show without you. Also want to thank the network sponsors, get the tea.com ancient life oil.com and metaphorical archeology. span And, uh, Barbara is doing some really good work there. You guys, I mean, changing lives with this stuff, the CFT stuff, two, one, four, nine, nine, five, three, seven, five, four. That's the number to call to call into the show tonight. It's one 800 
0335. I got the ringer on this time, so I ain't going to miss any phone calls because it's going to ring right into my headphones. And then also, if you want to join the Fringe FM chat, you can go to thefringe.fm forward slash chat room, and there's a live a live feed into the video, uh, a live feed into the shack if you sign up at our Patreon there. You can go to the website, lightingthevoid.com, and sign up to get all that stuff, all the goodies. All right. Um, so, yeah, Laird is with us here tonight, and I just want to say I think this is the third time that he's been on the show. And every single time I've had, um, uh, like in a, one of the biggest epiphanies that I've ever had on this show the last time that we talked, and I want to bring this up, like right from the jump, when we bring him on, it was about the relationship between spirit and matter or whatever we call spirit. But anyways, uh, I got a sound clip I need to keep, uh, for that. It was a proud moment in my life. So if you're not familiar with Laird Scranton, Laird Scranton is an independent researcher of ancient cosmology and language, and he studies in comparative cosmologies, and he has served help synchronize aspects of ancient African, Egyptian, Vedic, Chinese, Polynesian, and other world cosmologies, and it has, it's led to an alternative approach to reading Egyptian hi- hieroglyphic words. Uh, his degree is in English from Vassar College. His website's LairdScranton.com, which I think is uh, pretty much under development, but how, how um, have... How have you been during this uh, quarantine, Laird? Have you has your research been in lack because of it? <laughs> well, uh, hey, Joe, it's really nice to be back on your show again. I'm really glad to be uh, having an opportunity to talk again. Um, you know, the the life of a researcher and an author is pretty much uh, an at home life most of the time, anyway. So, so my everyday. Uh, um, Workings have really not been hampered too much by the the pandemic, but uh, I really feel feel for people whose lives have been really disrupted by it. Um, a lot of people are starting to to show the signs of cracking right now. You know, that seven or eight weeks into this, um, it isn't easy. Especially, I feel badly for people who are um, sheltering alone someplace, maybe in a studio or apartment. Um, not 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 an easy task for anybody. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's not, well, especially when like, you're like, live the lifestyles of both, if you're a researcher or uh, you work from home like I do, it's okay. And then, but it's sure, like, it's already kind of a lonely lifestyle for me in a way. But then when you go outside and you only see like a few people and then you walk around and those people are wearing masks, you're like, feels like you're in an Alfred Hitchcock film, right? Like something's not Yeah, it's really, really surreal. Not what we were expecting, you know? And the thing was, there wasn't a whole lot of warning. It's sort of like a, an adult game of, of red light, green light, where when they say red light, wherever you are, you stop. <laughs> yeah. And uh, a lot of people, I'm sure, didn't put much thought into where they were before the lockdown happened. No, I mean, just didn't really think like when it was coming on. I, I didn't, there was a lot of rumors about what was going to happen, but I was like, nah, surely not. It ain't going to lead to all that, but. Yeah, I guess, I guess it did. And, um, but I guess really the good thing is though, it has kept a lot of people from doing, uh, normal daily stuff, which has caused them to entertain themselves, hopefully, uh, with research and things like spirituality or maybe find new hobbies. And this is really interesting to me because this book you wrote about Ganesha, I mean, most of us in the spiritual community use Ganesha for spiritual reasons or maybe, Uh, just as a, you know, uh, something to look at on our altars or something to remind us of what the symbolism of Ganesha is. Um, But to really look at it and find that there is some serious uh, scientific symbolism in there is pretty fascinating. Now, what what got you like headed towards uh, the Hindu religion, though? Like, uh, did you even, is it just something you thought about or did your research lead to it? Uh, the research led to it. My my entry point to all this stuff, is, uh, some people may know, is the Dogen culture. This is modern uh, African tribe, uh, a primitive African tribe by our stater- standards. Um, but their culture is sort of an umbrella over three different ancient traditions. And so um, in getting to understand the Dogen references, the Dogen references are um, – the, the Dogen priests say they are scientific, basically. They're, they're saying they're describing how matter is created. And I got down to a certain point in their process and their symbolism and realized that one of the structures they were describing um, ties to Ganesha in certain ways. It's uh, the, the same, same symbolism being represented that, that represents Ganesha. Um, 
But as I got a little deeper, I realized that the Dogen, the way the Dogen are representing this thing, there's a female counterpart to the structure that they describe as Ganesha as being uh, symbolically masculine. There's a, a paired counterpart to that that's symbolically feminine. And so that got me wondering whether there had ever been an, any concept of a feminine Ganesha in Hinduism uh, and I did, or, or in Buddhism. I went to uh, all sorts of lengths to try to track it down. Um, and I kept coming across little references. In, in Hinduism, there is a concept like that. Um, in Buddhism, it was banned from inclusion in a master volume on Buddhism by an emperor in China uh, back in 1100 AD. It was so highly secretive that um, figures that were created to represent it were only allowed to be housed in portable shrines so they could be moved in a moment's, at a moment's notice if they needed to. Um, so when I realized that, that, um, I was coming across descriptions of, of the, this male, female Ganesha concept, um, the, the relationship relates to, um, the way energy flows between the non-material and the material, uh, domains. And the connection is characterized as an embrace. And so what I was looking for was any concept in India or China or elsewhere that might reflect this idea of embracing Ganesha as male and female. And I, I found a couple of references in, in uh, China to it, but uh, learned that it had been banned, but no, no visual representation of it at all. Um, hardly any mention of it in India. Um, one of my go-to sources is... Um, an authority on Buddhist architecture and symbolism. His name is Adrian Snodgrass, and he does mention the concept of um, embracing Ganesha's. He says that it survived in uh, Japan under the term Kanjiten. So I started searching for that concept and discovered, uh, first I came across some specifications of if you were going to build a figure to represent these two hugging Ganesha's, um, how should it be built? What materials should it be built out of? It should be made um, constructed from brass. It should be a certain height. Uh, there were certain features that were supposed to be represented. Uh, for instance, these are standing elephants, basically, that are hugging each other. And so um, one of them has a, a circular sun glyph on its head. And um, the two figures are standing with um, their left foot on top of the other figure's right foot and all sorts of little interesting details about this. So that's really how, how my entry um, into Hinduism came about, um, and I started becoming more interested in Ganesha. Um, eventually, looking online, trying to find a, a figure to represent this, my wife, Risa, came across um, a proper one, one built to the specifications. She found it um, through uh, an eBay site, I think, that was out of India. And the figure wasn't very expensive, even though it's a brass figure, you know, maybe it stands maybe 11 or 12 inches tall. Um, but the site said, uh, allow six to eight weeks for delivery. And I thought, well, that's, that's okay. You know, I've ordered things from India before. I don't mind that it takes six or eight weeks for a thing to get here. So we went ahead and ordered it. And three days later, it was the box turned up on my back door doorstep. Um, with the the figure, you can see a picture of it on the on the spine of the book at the mm. bottom. I use that as my icon for for. Um, I've taken to traditionally publishing one book every year and self publishing a second book because the the lag time for traditional publishing of books is much longer than it takes me to write the next one. Well, I think that your your books are just chock full of research and really good information, but I've it's really got so much information that I have to read it kind of a few times. And I, I don't know, like you remember the last time you were on the show and I said to you, I said, well, there's this, you know, that we have this idea that, um, when we die, we're going to go to this better place. Right. And, um, it's kind of like totally different than physical matter or something. It's just going to be the separate place when we die and it's going to be so much better and all that. But the more that, uh, I research stuff and the more I do things spiritually in my life, I'm starting to understand that or come to this either intuitive understanding 
the, this place that we call the metaphysical realm, whatever it may be, you know, spirit realm, whatever you want to call it, is just as dependent on this realm. And it's constantly trying to speak to us as we're trying to speak to it. But in ways that, and now I want to ask you, last time I told you that, you said, well, I got to tell you that you're incredibly intuitive because all of my research has kind of led to that. Do you remember that conversation? I do remember that conversation. I had a sort of a similar moment recently. I was reading a book by John Mack, um, who is deceased. He was a researcher of UFO uh, phenomenon. And uh, he opens his book with sort of a summary of where he had arrived at as a psychiatrist researching um, people who had been um, experiencers of UFO con contacts. Um, so he begins by summarizing what his whole perspective is on what the relationship is of those USO, UFO visitations um, to the questions of materiality and non-materiality. And it, I, it's almost word for word what, what I would write if I were writing it. He, 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 approaching it from an entirely different direction, has arrived at exactly the spot I'm in in terms of what I think is happening. Now, so it's interesting that, that you also have had that same had that same insight and um, the sense to speak up with it and so that I could comment on it, you know. Now, here's the second thing I want to ask you, uh, based on your research and your intuition and kind of like what's been going on with you. And I don't know if I'm right about this either, but I got a feeling like when when we do hear the language, like when it because it obviously it speaks in symbolism and it speaks in ways that we don't really, that, that we're learning to understand. Right. But when we actually right. listen to it or, or we do things that maybe it's asking us to do or just communicate with it as a whole, then we find out at least in my life, we get kind of rewarded for it. It's almost like a parent's like, yeah, you heard me. You understand what I'm saying. And then these synchronicities happen. Right. Well, one of the, the examples I use is imagine that you were from Eastern Europe and you were visiting in New York City and one night you, you ended up at a party and um, you didn't speak English and most of the people there didn't speak your language. But maybe, you know, half an hour into the party, you figured out that there was one guy over in the corner who spoke Ukrainian and you understood some Ukrainian. Chances are you're going to spend the whole rest of the night talking to that guy or trying to talk to that guy. And that's sort of the way that the relationship works for uh, the way I see it between non-materiality and materiality, that anyone who pays attention to the interesting little things that happen and starts to credit the possibility that there might be something to it suddenly fosters it to themselves because it's like, Hey, Hey, you know, Hey folks, we have somebody over here who's actually paying attention. Let's see what we can, can communicate. <laughs> yeah. So do you think, do you think that is that, that's been happening to you? That's been happening to you. Probably I would think more than most, I would think. And, and every researcher and author that I speak with, um, has th odd things happen. One of the first things you learn in the field of study I'm in is that there are things going on that we can't explain. Now in my personal life, up until I started writing about this stuff, I didn't rec really recognize a lot of the things that had happened. In retrospect, I see some things that I didn't re recognize at the time. But since I've started writing, all sorts of odd things happen. Uh, the arrival of that Ganesha figure in three days is one of them. And some of them are very objective. I mean, uh, one involved uh, back in the 1990s, a book that I couldn't find that um, – I had exhausted searches for the, for this book I needed for my research, and uh, one of my wife's aging cousins just coincidentally tossed it in a box with a bunch of random stuff he was trying to get rid of and mailed it off to us, not knowing I had any any interest in the book at all. And here was a copy of this unfindable book just handed to me. So that is, yeah. So you know, like, so where you know, everybody talks to you about your info and your facts and research, but. I think I've talked to you enough where I can ask you these kind of questions now. So where do you stand, uh, Laird, uh, spiritually? I, I mean, I know you're a curious guy, definitely probably one of the most curious and intelligent guys I've ever talked to in my life. But spiritually, <laughs> do you, where do you stand? Like, cause I feel like you're, you're trying to, you're doing this because you're being led spiritually. That's just kind of like what I feel. I could be totally wrong and I definitely don't want to speak for you. Um, 
okay, as I described myself, quote unquote, out of the box, you know, fresh out of the packaging, I would have described myself as probably the least spiritual guy I knew. Everything was transparent to me. I didn't really have any connection to what I would call um, spiritual synchronicities or anything like that. I didn't come from a particularly religious family. I had a religious upbringing that was Protestant. Um, I My parents were big believers in the idea that um, a household should only have one religion. Um, and so before I married my wife, I converted to Judaism um, for the sake of that. Um, actually, that was very fortunate I did that because – I learned many things during the course of that you know, conversion process that um, made it possible for me to recognize the things that I write about. Without that um, period of study, I wouldn't know a lot of the things, wouldn't know to, to notice a lot of the things that were important to my own later work. Um, the mindset of the, the cosmology, the philosophy that I'm pursuing comes out of a... Uh, a philosophy in India called Samkhya. It's a companion to yoga. And it's, so you have the cosmological philosophy called Samkhya. You have the personal personalized philosophy called yoga. And they are parallel with each other. The terminology is the same. The concepts are very similar, very parallel, except applied a little bit differently. I, I have an adult daughter who studies um, yoga who very often she'll talk to me about something she's, uh, come to realize through yoga, and she'll start a sentence, and I'll finish it for her because it's all the same stuff. It's very, very um, similar. Now, Samkhya is non-theistic. It's expressly non-theistic. In other words, it admits that there are things going on that we don't understand, but it doesn't see that as a reason to deify the things we don't understand. You know, um, the new book that I have that you probably need to get, I highly recommend getting it, is Ganesha, The Scientific Symbolism of a Hindu God. And we'll get into that book in a little bit more after the break. Uh, if you want to, you can also go to uh, thefringe.fm and check out the, the website there. It's not ready, but when you guys like see the new website, you're going to love it, man. But uh, there's a way you can support the network, too. You can always donate and support the network, but if you go to any of our sponsors or use any of our sponsor stuff just tell them we sent you there we'll be right back with Laird's Grant stay with us emotional freedom techniques or tapping to actually neutralize the effects of that event. Maybe when you tell the story now, your heart races and your palms get sweaty, you don't even want to think about it because you don't know how to neutralize that. That's what EFT tapping does. It neutralizes those emotions. The circuit that that was recorded on is gone. The energy flows freely and you're free of it. And that's what emotional freedom is all about. We offer this as a pro bono service, but this is something that I offer because because no one, it seems, is helping people with these experiences. If you'd like to reach me, it's really easy. My cell phone is 214-995-3754. Please leave a message. I will get back to you as quickly as possible. Or you can email me, barb.eft at gmail.com. And EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Techniques. Reach out to me. It's confidential. This works. You won't believe the results. All right, man, this is Crow Triple Seven, and you are listening to The Fringe FM. Right, me old chiners, I know it's an ad break, but before you lot shoot off and make yourself a cup of Rosie Lee or whatever else it is you're going to sling down your Gregory Peck, you need to listen to me bubble. If, like me, you found your way to light in the void via a downloadable podcast, you might want to take a butcher's at the Fringe FM Wind and Kite. You won't Adam and Eve how many other shows there are or what they rabbit on about. Ancient history, conspiracy, the consciousness, the esoteric, the occult, metaphysics, parapolitical, ufology, technology, Technology and spirituality to name but a few. They got featured hosts like Ryan Gable, Jeremy Scott, Alex Exum, Tim Doyle, Cortana and Gigi, Susanna Ross, the Reverend John Polk, Michael Deacon, and JD Lewis. You might find yourself listening to the thoughts and theories of the author of the fish you just finished reading. Or you could pick up the dog and bone, call in and tell everyone your own beliefs or experiences. So do me a favour, before you put on the ansel or crack open a bottle of Vino or roller join, go to the Fringe FM and see what you're missing. 
Please listen. Now is not the time to fear. When your immune system is strong, shields up. You have very little worries. If your immune system is compromised, you're susceptible to all viruses. I say shields up and no fear. Try Heart Love from GetTheTea.com. Heart Love has a special ingredient called allicin. It comes from the healing part of the garlic plant. No garlic breath. No garlic leaking out your pores, just pure immune building ingredients that gets your shields up. Heart Love is a unique blend of herbs that loves to build you up. Google garlic and know the benefits. One Heart Love pill is equal to 20 cloves of garlic. 20 cloves. Shields up. You've heard of our life change cleansing tea at getthetea.com. Now try Heart Love. And by the way, take your blood pressure and watch weekly what happens. So here's how to purchase. Log on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. And build your shields. That's getthetea.com. Mention Ray in the coupon code and hit apply and receive free shipping. From a cave in the depths of your mind, it's Light in the Void with Joe Root. I'm getting older and noticing that my body just doesn't work as well as it used to. So I like to keep fit as possible by hitting the gym a few times a week. Recently, I started having a nagging bicep pain and it got so bad I couldn't even lift the weights. When I was complaining about it to a friend, he told me about Angioprim. He said chelation helps remove toxins, heavy metals, and cholesterol in veins and arteries that may cause blockages. You know, after just one week of taking Angioprim, the pain was gone and now I'm back in the gym full strength. Scientific research proves the active ingredient in angioprim has superior oral chelation action that helps promote cardiovascular health. So to learn more, go to angioprim.com. That's A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M.com. Or talk to a trained consultant. Call angioprim toll-free at 945-882-7221. You'll feel better with more energy. That's 945-882-7221. Or go to the website, angioprim.com. The Fringe FM isn't just a radio station. We also provide services for all your audio production needs. If you are interested in live radio or pre-recorded podcasts, we're here to help. We even do audio enhancements and voiceovers if needed. If you want to do a podcast or live radio show and even want the option to syndicate on terrestrial radio from simple audio file enhancement to live production and call screening, we have you covered. We have worked with some of the best professionals in the business in order to provide coaching instruction for content creation, show structure, and more. Contact The Fringe Digital Media for more at info at thefringe.fm. That's info at thefringe.fm. Or call 501-777-5631 for a consultation. Hey, I'm J.M. DeBoard, and when I want to talk about dreams, I look up my man Joe Root and his show, Lighting the Void. to Lighting the Void. The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at 501-777-5631. All right, welcome back to Lighting the Void. Laird Scranton's our guest tonight. We've got him on the phone. Apparently, uh, the uh, internets are clogged due to the uh, quarantine. That's something I think we're all kind of getting used to. So we're talking about, uh, Laird, we're talking about your new book and then we're ancient cosmology, the Dogon, but your new book, uh, it's, well, it's fairly new anyways, is Ganesha, the scientific symbolism of a Hindu God. Something that I, when I went to college, I learned out, I thought that Judaism was the oldest religion that we were aware of, right? Obviously that you're aware right. that the, the Dogon is much older than all of it, right? But well, well, what's interesting is that just this month, okay, in the book that you're reading, uh, some of the points that are being made there are that from from the point of view of researchers in India of the art of Ganesha, that artwork only goes back to the um, early centuries A.D. That's not very far back. And the textual references to Ganesha go back a little bit further to the late centuries B.C. But Every source I went to um, 
would say the same thing, which is that, well, based on my professional opinion, based on what I know about how things work, um, talking about art, talking about text, talking about myths, talking about language, whatever it was, I see indications that Ganesha has to have been important in India much, much, much longer than that. I just don't have any evidence of it. Hmm. So in the last month, I was uh, making a post on Facebook one day. Um, it was about Gobekli Tepe. And at Gobekli Tepe, you have um, some really interesting sets of symbols. And one of the, okay, the, the hugging Ganeshas I was talking about um, represent the concept of the embrace between universes, the transfer of energy between universes. And that concept is repeated symbolically at Gobekli Tepe probably a half a dozen or more different ways. And one of the ways that it's presented is with symbols that look like the English letter H. That symbol survived in the Masonic tradition. I have an article from the, the turn of the last century from a Masonic magazine called the New Age Magazine, where the article is entirely about that H symbol. And the bottom line is it represents, it's a representation of the feminine and masculine energies that come together to catalyze creation. So it's exactly the same symbolism as Ganesha. So I was making a post on Facebook with some pictures, and there were multiple pictures, not just one. And it was the pictures of, uh, I wanted to depict these H symbols and a couple of the other symbols. There's one of the H symbols there on the end of one of the pillars that is very stylized. You can see that it's an H, but it's oddly an H. It's not, not just a, a pure H. There, there's some contours to the lines there that really shouldn't be there if you were just writing the letter H. I had never thought very deeply about that. But when I posted it on Facebook, anytime you make a post on Facebook with more than one photo, it tries to bring up sort of a montage of, of three or four photos. And so you only see a little section magnified on the screen that when normally you'd see the whole picture. And the section that was magnified was this odd little H symbol. And suddenly, I realized, I could see, because it was magnified so much, that it wasn't the letter H, it was the image of two elephants. Well, we don't. And so, so here we have, okay, in the context of all the same symbolism of Ganesha, an overt depiction of the two elephants together representing that same concept. This pushes Ganesha's symbolism back 9,000 years earlier than anybody has been able to show it existed. I, I have um, uh, proposals in with a couple of different academic journals to offering to write an article about that. So then, then it's, <clears throat> it's much older than we think then. I mean, because I knew like in college I uh, found out that, okay, Hinduism is the oldest religion that we know about. Like it's not, uh, like I thought it was Judaism, but you're saying that it probably goes back further than, further than what we've recorded. That, yeah, that, that concept. Samkhya is older than any of the religious traditions in India. It's the foundation for all of you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, the, the Vedic tradition and so forth. Everything, all of the major stuff in India comes out of Samkhya. But this concept of the hugging Ganeshas, hugging elephants, representing this feminine and masculine energy, clearly goes all the way back to Gobekli Tepe. I have it in carved stone, beautiful images of the two elephants, um, 11,000 years old. It's, wow. it's, it's um, almost impossible to argue that it's not the, uh, a truthful perspective. So... <clears throat> So you talk about, there's a quote in here I found that was cool in your book, too, about mandalas. It says, every stoop embodies a mandala, and some its presence is outwardly expressed by those elements such as gates or stairways, which indicate a cross-form arrangement of the axes. In others, it is made apparent by images of Buddhas or other divinities located in the four directions. So what it is, what is it about the cross that, I'm, that you're wanting to portray here? Okay. The, the mindset is we have two qualities of energy that come together, and the bringing of those two energies together is what catalyzes all of the structures of matter of the material universe that we are familiar to us. But, okay, scientifically that's true. All of those structures rest on electromagnetism, which combines magnetism and electricity together. 
But the way those two energies come together is in the configuration of, they come together perpendicular, so perpendicular to each other. So they end up creating an axis. Now, there are signs that that, that axis is not just a symbolic thing, that there are structures in the universe that go you know, thousands of light years out, hundreds of thousands of light years out, that align consistently together as if there's um, some kind of controlling axis for how these things have to line up. So this is a, an, an under, underlying principle of these energies. Um, the do, based on the comparative references I make with the Dogen and, and Kabbalism and some other groups, it looks as if non-materially the energy is akin to magnetism. It's like magnetism. Um, on the material side, just before the creation of material structures, the magnetism seems to be like electricity. Um, when you get to four dimensions, which is where we are materially, you have those two combined. So you've now created a third kind of energy, which is uh, the spectrum that visible light is on. I mean, it, it's a spectrum that includes visible light. So it's almost as if th these are all dimensional forms of the same root energy and it just expresses itself one way um, it, it, you know two dimensionally as magnetism three dimensionally as electricity and four dimensionally as electromagnetism uh, so when we talk get down to concepts of of the cross for me symbolically um, okay part of the problem for me with my research here is that the focus is at around 3000 BC, which is just at the time when text, textual data starts to appear. Christianity sits at the year zero, and we sit at the year 2020. So Christianity is actually further removed from the material I'm looking at than we are from Christianity. So even though I see I come across references in Christianity that are, that are absolutely right on the money in terms of the cosmo cosmology I'm pursuing and the symbolism I'm pursuing. Someone obviously understood things about it at, at the time of Christianity. That's not the stopping point for me in terms of trying to get to the bottom of the meaning of something because you have to go 3,000 years earlier than that at least before you get down to the bottom of what did somebody mean originally when they said this thing. Yeah, that's so, that's strange to me, though. You know, <clears throat> because of some of the conscious exploration we've done as far as, like, astral travel goes and stuff, and the techniques that we do talks about, like, you feel, especially when you're making, like, a transition from your body to this local place, and it could just be in the mind for sure, but I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. But you do feel that electric current kind of going through your body. Like it, it hums. A lot of people talk about that. You know, like Robert Monroe, name them. They all, they've all talked about it. Um, right. So I wonder if you're actually, it'd be kind of curious. I wonder if you're actually passing, passing through that, maybe that, that cross or that barrier that you're talking about. Yeah, that, that could be, I mean, there are an awful lot of open questions about what happens inside consciousness. I mean, with consciousness for the Dogen, when the Dogen talk about creation, they're talking about three parallel themes. Um, one is how the universe forms, another is how matter forms, and the third one is about how biological reproduction happens. But the concept is that, that these themes are parallel to each other, so parallel that the Dogen actually define all three themes simultaneously using the same uh, sequence of symbols. So every symbol along, you know, from waves up to the atom in terms of what they represent has meaning not just in terms of how matter forms, but it also has parallel meaning for how the universe forms and parallel meaning for how bio biology happens, and that includes consciousness. So if we think of an electron as being a subdivision of a grand source of energy, we can also look at individual consciousness as being a subdivision of a grand consciousness, that the potential for consciousness is built right into the dynamic of energy that causes matter to happen. 
it's the same thing. It's all wrapped up together as one thing. Um, so, <laughs> have you found Buddhism any of this? And Kabbalism, yeah, I was, wow, right? I was just fixing to ask you about that, about Kabbalism. No, go ahead. Yeah, Buddhism, Kabbalism, the Dogen tradition, uh, Samkhya, a um, number of other uh, traditions um, share a perspective on how how that all comes about. Um, they share, okay, you were talking about hermeticism uh, before we started uh, broadcasting, um, the hermetic theme of as above, so below. Well, one of the big thrusts of the Dogen symbolism is to demonstrate that theme. They're pointing us to structures where this structure we can see up in, in outer space is a match for a structure we can't see directly down in the formation of matter. And illustrating for us that all of these concepts, all of these root dynamics of energy are happening on, in, par, in parallel all the way up the scales. They were the same handful of dynamics that underlie the symbolism of Ganesha in the book you have are the the dynamics of energy that repeat all the way up the scale. So if you wonder, if you can uh, take a close look at any example of one of those dynamics where you can see it, you can pretty much guess what the dynamic has to be in the places you can't see it. Yeah, that is that is very interesting, actually. So what? So what? Are, what are your thoughts on? consciousness studies now when it comes to uh science as like i don't think science has has gotten to where they need to be with it yet but i do think that we're progressing in a lot of ways uh because i have been doing a little bit more research based on like science-based research on this but do you feel like that we still have just as long a way to go to get into this more than when you first started doing your research even though your research is more dedicated to symbolism I know you kind of keep up with all that too. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, Stephen Hawking said it in one of the last statements he made before he died. He observed that he had come to the conclusion that the whole process, the whole dynamic, the whole set of truth that we're trying to get at may actually be a lot simpler than we think it is. Um, in all of the classic tr religions, they beat us over the head with the idea that um, the fundamentals of creation are unknowable. They're, they are inherently unknowable. There's no way for a human mind to comprehend how these things work. And that's true with public Buddhism. The exoteric Buddhism says that also. It says, this is unknowable stuff, folks. Don't even try. This is above your pay grade. But do you but believe But when that? I was studying all... Well, when I was studying all this stuff, it was looking more and more and more like, hey, this is not unknowable. This boils down to some very, uh, some very rudimentary things. And if you understand those rudimentary things, there's a perspective from which the whole thing simplifies. It's like reducing fractions, you know, from, from this complicated fraction that you suddenly realize resolves down to two-thirds. <laughs> you know, um, they're just using bigger numbers to express it. Yeah. Well, now you get to esoteric Buddhism, which is the private Buddhism, and they say, well, they admit that the tradition occasionally fibs, and one of those fibs is that this stuff is unknowable. In fact, it's entirely knowable. How can it not so, be? I mean, like, how can it not be knowable? Every, every science, right. if you look at gematria, if you look at sacred geometry, your research with the symbolism, which is, I, I would say, a little bit more profound and a, you have to do some uh, deeper diving, but it just seems like it, all the roads lead to knowing that we're supposed to right. try to know. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of, of what, the, what I think the actual perspective is when any of these traditions says that it's unknowable. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the optical illusion of the faces that create the, the reverse image vase, the yeah, flower vase. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now the way the way human perception works, you can't simultaneously focus on both the faces and the vase at the same time. If you're focusing on the faces, 
you can't clearly see the base. And if you're focusing clearly on the base, you can't clearly see the faces. That's the way perception works. Well, in Tibetan Buddhism, the, the root of all this stuff is something called the mind itself. And they say that the mind itself is unknowable in that same way. That, and the reason it's unknowable in that same way is because it rests on a dynamic of energy that is an oscillation. It's called a dipole. And it's the idea that when you have positive and negative energies that come together, they tend to oscillate. They come together, and then they move apart. They move together, and then they move apart like a beating heart. Uh, and they continue to do that. If you leave them alone, they just continue to do that, in and out, in and out, in and out. Now, that dynamic, is that Tibetan Buddhism re refers to it as being at, at all at one time both empty and clear. And empty and clear, empty is a reference to the condition when the two energies have moved completely apart, as far apart as they can. It, the space is empty. The condition when they come together is called clear. In Dogen culture, there's a concept of the clear word. This is where the essence of the thing re resides, that if you understand the essence of a thing, you understand the clear word. So now... To get to consciousness, we ha uh, to, uh, go by way of another example. You know that if you close one eye and look out into the room, you see a two-dimensional image of what you're seeing. It looks flat. There's no dimensionality. There's no depth to the image of what you're seeing. We know because of experience that something a larger object is probably closer and a smaller object is probably farther away. And so you can sort of guess the dimensionality, but you can't really see it. As soon as you have two different perspectives on the same image, slightly offset from each other, now you, get, you automatically get a three-dimensional image of the same scene, where you can tell which object is closer and which object is farther away. Well, consciousness, to me, works the same way. That consciousness is an automatic outgrowth of the ability to reconcile two perspectives, one of overview and one of detail, and that what the human brain goes through in terms of trying to understand things is that process, the process of reconciling, here's what I see when I look at it in total, here's what I see when I look at it in the details of it, and reconciling those two perspectives, now suddenly you have consciousness if you have the ability to do that. Well, my outlook is that that's a function of the same oscillation of energy. It, it's giving you, when, it, when it's expanded, you have the overview perspective, and when, it's, when it comes together, you have the detail perspective. You may even think of it as a dimensional thing, because when the two energies come together, you have a geometric point, and when they move apart, you have the equivalent of a geometric line or a geometric area. And, and, do the, and does that, what you're talking about, still correspond, if you think about it, right? And I know you don't want to have to get too graphic here, but if you think about it as far as like, male and female energy goes too, right? Um, there's a, Right. It's, a, it's the same concept where, yeah, between the universes, the female and the male energy are the positive, or the negative, positive and negative, whichever way you want to look at it, energies that cause that dynamic of oscillation to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And my studies about that spiritually have been mainly from Kabbalism. So the you know the the idea of chokma that is just straight force right and it's just this energetic force and then they have you know bina which is the you know the pillar of uh, severity or negative energy female energy which is form so it takes force and form to create um you know just to create the matter the living world kind of thing so but what you're talking right, about I is observation of the whole and observation of the detail of the detail, which is just the 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 biological counterpart to what you're talking about. Right, exactly. Okay, in that's what I was saying. In, right, in, in Do, the Dogen tradition and Kabbalism and in these other traditions, there's Tomke really describes this first that universes form in pairs, and that there is a cycle of energy that a scrolling energy between the two universes that um, is ongoing. It's, 
it's a cycle that, that's compared to the natural water cycle on the Earth. The natural water cycle is um, the idea that water evaporates from the ocean to form clouds to then move over the land and then up over the mountains. And when they get high enough up, they drop rain, which then flows back to the sea. If you didn't have that cycle of water on the planet, you wouldn't have life on the planet. Well, the Dogans say that without the cycle of energy between the two universes, you wouldn't have life in the universe. Yes. Yeah. Now, in Kabbalism, they refer to that concept as symbolically as the primordial scroll. This is what a Torah scroll in Judaism represents. Right. In Judaism, um, every every Jewish temple in the world, um, over the course of the year, makes its way one portion at a time to that Torah scroll timed out so they finish the scroll by the end of the year. And then they rewind the scroll and they start again. That's symbolic of this energy that scrolls between the universes. Only with the universes, it's a, um, almost a 13,000-year cycle, whereas um, in Judaism, it's a, an annual cycle. But the energy pers persistently moves from one universe to the other, and then... After it reaches a certain point, it moves back. This is an oscillation of energy. That's exactly the same as a dipole. There are electric dipoles. There are atomic dipoles. As a matter of fact, the dynamic of the, those universes, the way the dipole works with them, strikes me as being very much a parallel to the dynamic of a water molecule. And so when they're talking symbolically about water this, water that, face of the waters, um, um, things acting as waves, um, all that stuff, this is symbolic, but actually there's a, letter at which, a, a level at which it may actually be literal, that, that the relationship of these universes to each other may actually literally represent something that's very much like a molecule of water. Would you ever consider doing uh, a book on Kabbalism as it relates to cosmology? Um, I probably wouldn't because Kabbalism has its own, um, how can I say this? It has its, uh, its own prescribed ways of thinking about things. It has its own set of, uh, terminology to express things. It has its own history um, through the Hebrew language and through commentators and so forth that things are presented a in a particular way and looked at in a particular way. And so I would, the things I write about compared to Kabbalism in my book, um, Seeking the Primordial, which gets down to these dynamics of energy, I bring Kabbalist references into it all the time. But I don't feel qualified to write a Kabbalist book as such. Um, I'm writing about the same material, but from a different perspective. Um, again, I'll give you another example to compare that to. There's a, um, I have a friend who is a, a medical intuitive, and she recommended a book to me um, that came out of uh, an African medical healing tradition. Um, she had never read the book herself, but she had an intuitive sense that this was the book that she was supposed to recommend to me. The book was written by a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Maladoma Somme. Um, he was born into a tribe called the Dagara, who are cousins to the Dogon in Africa. But as a child, he got kidnapped from the tribe and taken away from Africa and, and educated in a Western tradition. And then by the time he was a teenager, he decided he wanted to be initiated in his tribal tradition, went back to um, Burkina Faso, where he was born, and convinced them to initiate him into his own tribe. So here we have a person who has one foot in the Western world and one foot in the African world who's made it his mission to try to put into perspective for the Western mind what all these concepts of the African world are. So I get this book I've never seen before, written by somebody I don't know, um, about a healing tradition that I'm not familiar with, and here's this guy speaking from personal experience 
describing all the things, same things that I write about, but expressing them in the, almost exactly the same way that I understand them. Yeah, see what I mean? Like, is, like spirit is just dropping things in your lap. Now, how, did, yeah, how do you think that and works, I, though? That's so wild. That's wild. Well, the, the way I think it works is the first thing you have to do is, with any student, is make sure they're paying attention. So once it reached a point where it was clear that I was paying attention to this material, that I was paying cl close attention to it, every so often, okay, the course of my study is such that um, if I learn 10 things today, chances are eight of those things fall, fall into a category that I don't know how to, don't have any ex explanation for. I don't have an understanding of it. I have a general sense that this is important. I file it away someplace where I can find it again. And maybe two of the things out of the 10 I learned today are actual facts that I can argue, I know what this means and here's why it means it. So you get this like a conceptual stack of paperwork of all of these loose ends that along the way I didn't know what to do with. And every so often, just the right piece of information falls into place and now suddenly a whole book's worth of those, those unattributed facts pulled together in the context of a book. It doesn't take me a whole lot of time to research it because I already have all the facts gathered. It's just I don't know how to make sense of them until this other fact falls in place. So part of the process was I had to learn to pay attention to the random question that comes my way that seems like it's out of left field. Somebody I don't know from across the world sends me an email and says, by the way, do you know about the concept of such and such? Uh, do you think... Um, such and such could be true about this concept. And it might be something I've never researched. But I've learned over time that when that happens, I need to pay attention to it, and I need to follow up on it, and I need to see where it leads. And when I do that, I mean, the, the book that I wrote about Scarab Bray uh, in northern uh, Scotland came out of a single question from a person saying, did I think there could be Egyptian influences there um, at 3200 B.C.? And I honestly didn't think there could be. I thought... 3200 BC is way, way, way too soon for Egypt to be reaching out anywhere. Um, dynastic Egypt doesn't even happen till a couple hundred years after that. Wow. But, but when you entertain an idea, you explore it and you try to sort out, okay, you say, what if this were true? If this were true, what would I expect to see? And then you go look and see if you see that. Well, when I got got to finding out about Scarborough in Scotland, I realized that it, it's not really credible that there are Egyptian influences at Scarabre at 3200 BC, but it's absolutely credible that there are Scarabre influences on Egypt at 3000 BC. And That's so, so the entire book falls out just because I paid attention to this question that somebody sent me. Yeah, that is like, that is fascinating. Seriously, we got to take a break here, but... If you're in the Patreon feed and you're watching the feed into the studio, it is kind of synchronistic. If any of you guys know the tarot cards, we talked about the cross, um, the two energies, and the Torah. And if you look at the high priestess card, which I'm going to show the camera here, that she's wearing a cross on her shirt with a garden of uh, pomegranates behind her with the two pillars of the two energies and holding the script of the Torah in her hand. Which you got to think to yourself, what do the Masons in Western society and these mystery schools really know if Laird Scranton is talking about the symbols on the High Priestess card? We'll be right back. Fringe FM. 
Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS app store. Hey, this is No Way Jose, a Northern California Piscean stuck in the Arizona desert. I'm a void walker, and I got the shoes to prove it. So what do I do when my soul yearns to delve deep into the realm of the unknown? I aim my satellite straight into the night sky and catch a smooth ride on the KTLK DB radio waves. I tune into Lighting the Void with Joe Root on the French FM. Joe, Lighting the Void is the best show on the planet. This is Barney, your friend from Facebook. Thank you and all the crew for all you do. Namaste, my friend. This is Macon from the Foothills of North Carolina, and I am a board walker. G'day, board walkers. This is Lily from Down Under Australia. The world may be small, but Nick Murray's great. So let your curiosity take you for a journey with Joe Root. Hey, this is V, coming in from Central Maryland, and I am a void walker. This is Kevin Darkerty, a beginner void walker. I'm from Vancouver, BC. I know a little about a lot, and uh, as Leonard Skinner said, I guess the rest. I learned a lot from uh, Mr. Root and the show. And I uh, heard it from the beginning. I knew right then he was going to be a New York Bell. Thanks for all your shows uh, and keep it up. Hey, this is Derek from Mass, aka the Night Stalker, and I'm a void walker. This is Mark from Chicago, and I walk the void to ascertain what is consciousness. My name is Jared Johnson, and I'm from Humboldt County, California. I do not know all the answers to the questions about reality. I do not claim to know the ultimate truth about life. I seek that which has been made hidden as a part of a family of explorers of consciousness. I'm a void walker. Thanks, Joe Root. I'm Clyde Lewis. You are listening to The Fringe FM. Hey, is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. Have you ever seen an ad or banner which brought you a feeling that someone is reading your mind or even listening to your conversations? Your online data is being used against you. Surfshark is a VPN service that makes online privacy protection easy and attainable. You can use it on as many devices as you'd like simultaneously. Surfshark encrypts all internet traffic sent to and from your devices and ensures that your IP address remains hidden. The VPN service that we use at UFO Seekers plus one month free for $1.99 a month. Visit surfshark.deals slash seekers. We all have that story to tell in our lives. The winds were howling. The ground shook. You could hear rushing water. And then history repeats itself. When there's no power, refrigeration fails. Stores with their shelves strip bare. ATMs can't operate. Deliveries stop. Then what? These events can last days or weeks. You need a plan. In statements made during recent interviews, FEMA Administrator Brock Long has repeatedly urged all Americans to understand three truths. FEMA is broke. The system is broken. If this is the new normal, Americans can't rely on federal cavalry when disaster strikes. Don't get caught out in the elements empty-handed. Prepare with us by going to preparewiththefriends.com and get your two-week food supply, 92 servings, eight food varieties with 25-year shelf life, normally $137, now only $75. Or get a month's supply, normally $247, now only $147 shipped in one business day. Just go to preparewiththefriends.com or call 888-440-793. That's 888-440-7931. Give this great offer and be prepared while it lasts. Hey, Fringe listeners. This is Dave Cruz, host of Beyond the Strange Radio, asking you to join us live Sunday evenings at 7 p.m. Pacific Time, 10 p.m. Eastern, right here on The Fringe FM. Visit beyondthestrange.com for links to chat, social media, and schedules of the show. And remember, always stay strange. Asta. 
somewhere between abnormal and paranormal. There's a show called Into the Paranormal. I'm Jeremy Scott. Hear me live Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern on the Fringe FM. Parabnormal News Coronavirus Update. I'm Brad Bernards. The United Nations is warning that the world is at risk of widespread famines of biblical proportions due to the coronavirus pandemic that has infected more than 2.5 million people worldwide since the virus emerged late last year. That according to reporting in The Hill. The executive director of the World Food Program, David Beasley, addressed the U.N. Security Council during a video conference Tuesday. Uh, At the same time, while we're dealing with COVID-19 pandemic, we're also on the brink of a hunger pandemic. In my conversations with world leaders over the past many months, before the coronavirus even became an issue, I was saying that 2020 would be facing the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II for a variety of reasons. There are no famines yet, Beasley said, but I must warn you that if we don't prepare and act now to secure access, avoid funding shortfalls and disruption to trade, we could be facing multiple famines of biblical proportions within a short few months. But with COVID-19, an additional 130 million people could be pushed to the brink of starvation by the end of the year. A new high-pressure ventilator developed by NASA engineers and tailored to treat coronavirus patients was approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use under the FDA's March 24th Ventilator Emergency Use Authorization. We have the potential to save human lives, people that we might know, our neighbors, our families. And that intensity, it's amazing. And as stressful as this has been for everybody in the last couple of weeks, not one of us can stop. Michelle Easter, JPL Mechatronics Engineer. Connect with the news at paraabnormalradio.com. I'm Brad Bernards, Paraabnormal News Coronavirus Update. toll free from the United States or Canada. You're listening to Lighting the Bar right. Radio. We're back with Laird Scranton, and uh, as we were talking about the symbolism, uh, I started thinking about, you know, you were talking about the cross and the two energies and the male and female energy and creation uh, and the Torah. You brought up the Torah, and I started thinking about um, the tarot deck because the tarot deck is like full of symbolism and I, immediately I thought about the high priestess card the card uh, the second card in the major arcana which is the high priestess which I'm going to hold up to the camera here hopefully last time I didn't hold it up good enough and you can see most of the symbols that he is talking about is in this card and if you look up what this card actually means it pretty much corresponds with the mysteries and what's hidden but I'll let you pick apart this card and how it shows, like, probably a lot of stuff you already talked about, Laird. I think we should do that because you were doing it during break, and I was like, no, no, let's wait. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, the best way to get at this is the same way the Buddhists get at it. Uh, if I were a new initiate to Buddhism, the first exercise they would teach me involves some very basic geometry, which sits at the heart of sacred geometry. Um, the way it works is they would take me out into a field. I would plant a stick vertically in the ground and then using cubits, which is uh, the measure the measure from the end of my elbow to the tip of my finger, or alternately it's the average pacer step, my average pacer step, they would have me measure out um, 10 paces out um, to the edge of a circle that I would draw around that central stick. Now, that combination is basically a a sundial. Um, It gives you the ability to track uh, time during the daylight hours in the same way that a clock does. This is linear time, linear material time. Okay, Okay, then the next phase is they would have me mark the two longest shadows of the day, morning and night, where the shadow of the stick crosses that circle. Now, because 
the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, those two points are always going to be aligned east and west automatically. So now I have the ability to draw a line that's aligned east and west. Um, if I then were to draw two more circles using those two points as the center points of the new circles, only with a slightly larger radius than the first circle, okay. I would create two more circles that that overlap each other at two points that are now aligned north and south. And the space in between those two points is the Vesica Pisces shape. It's shaped like an almond because the two circles overlap and it creates this almond shape. Oh, I see what you're looking at now. Okay. Okay. Now, the Buddhists say that is how space emerges, that this is recreating how space emerges. And what we're really seeing is the equivalent of an overlap between non-materiality and materiality. The Dogen consider that almond space to be a gateway between universes. And within that gateway, the laws of physics that we experience materially don't apply anymore. That's where entanglement of particles happens. Okay, so what we're seeing in the High Priestess card to begin with is a gateway. Um, at Gobekli Tepe, the concept, okay, Budge um, says that the concept of, of the T pillars that we see at Gobekli Tepe um, can represent the idea of a gateway. So the two pillars that we're seeing here on either side of the Priestess, to my way of thinking, are an indication that what we're looking at is a gateway. That almond space that gets defined as the gateway is the domain of deity. In Buddhism, the word deity comes from a word datu. It's basically the same word that's at the root of our, our um, concept of data. Datu for Buddhism, Buddhism is the structure that never changes. In, in the processes of creation of matter, this is the structure that's not subject to change. And so their concept of and they're not deifying this. Their concept of Datu is, here's the structure that doesn't change. So it's the spot, it's the residence of the Dogen um, mother goddess who creates matter. They don't really call her a goddess. It's really the Dogen uh, non-material feminine who is responsible for the creation of matter. Her domain, her name is Ama. It's also, Ama is also the nickname that Ganesha calls his mother, Sati. Ama resides in that gateway space. So that's what we have on this card is a picture of the equivalent of, of Ama. Now, because of the way those bisecting lines, the, the east-west and the north-south lines intersect each other, at her heart we have the axis, the cross. On her head, we have a symbol of the sun. The sun is an icon of materiality. That's what Ra is. Um, the sun glyph in Egypt is a dot in the center of a circle, the same way that the stick we placed in the field is a dot in the center of a circle. Right. That's a dynamic of energy. It's called angular momentum. It represents what spinning, the form that spinning energy takes um, when two different qualities of energy come together, they tend to spin. And when they spin, they create that shape. It's the first shape, that first coherent shape of matter that formed after the Big Bang. The moon shape down by her feet for the Dogen is a symbol of Sirius, and Sirius is an icon for the non-material the same way that the sun is an icon for the material. And so you go to many of these ancient cultures like ancient Egypt or the Dogen or other groups, and the start of the year is marked by the point where Sirius and the sun come together. It's the heliacal rising of Sirius. What happens is that because of the glare of our sun, and the way the motions of the of the Earth and the Sun and Sirius are, there's a period of time where 
our view of Sirius is blocked because it um, sits behind the glare of the sun. We can't see it for a period of time. And then suddenly, if we're watching every day, we notice the Sirius reappears. It reappears by rising just before sunrise, just ahead of the sun. That's called the helical rise of Sirius. It's significant because, symbolically, that's the point where Sirius and the sun come together, and Sirius and the sun come together are a metaphor for these two energies coming together. It's a starting point. It's a starting point for matter. And it's also the starting point for the year. If you look also, you know that you were talking about the Vesica Pisces, right? If you look right. on the, the High Priestess card, you see the hat that she's wearing? Right. Do you think that that's a symbol of of that, of the two circles, of the energies on both sides, um, and that point in the middle is kind of like could be the... More, more likely, the Vesica Pisces shape is her scarf because the axis, the center of the axis, sits at the center of that spinning energy. It's And it's more shaped like a gateway, and too. it's more look shaped at, like... Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. You also see the yeah. I mean, the, her. We have the 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 solid blue scarf-like dress coming down on either side. That's sort of the the shape of that almond piece, the Vesca Pisces piece, and the white whiter scarf that's right closer to her neck and on her chest is more like the concept of the the waters, the wave black like matter where this all this dynamic happens, of energy happens. We're talking about at the quantum level where we see mat where matter to us looks like waves. And the the moon glyph? The moon glyph is symbolic of Sirius. The white circle in her headdress is symbolic of the sun. The two coming together is symbolic of a sanctuary. A sanctuary is the place where those two things come together. Which Go back to Tepe is is a sanctuary. It has symbols. symbols. All these, uh, okay, you're probably familiar with the three handbag-shaped symbols. I have to go back to the tepe on one of the yeah. colors. They, it's a, um, a semicircle attached to a square shape, three of them together. Well, roundness is symbolic of the non-material. Squareness is symbolic of the material. When the two come together, you have the same concept of the energies coming together, which is what defines a sanctuary. In Iraq, in the region of Iraq at the time of Gobekli Tepe, or just, or just following that time, um, there was a type of um, shrine or sanctuary called a Chaitya that was defined by three domes. Um, Buddhism also has symbol symbolism that relates to three domes. In science, when they talk about mass forming as a consequence of energies coming together, the way they explain it is in relation to the shape of a geometric dome. So a dome becomes a symbol for mass or matter. Um, what we see behind our high priestess, okay, first of all, the black leaves that are at the top of the space behind her and that seem to fill in a lot of the space behind her are um, look very much like how the, both the Dogen and astrophysic, modern astrophysicists d um, define um, the, this is primordial energy, the remnants of primordial energy from the Big Bang. This is um, uh, the way they depict what they can see on satellites of what's left over of that initial energy that um, was emitted by the Big Bang. Um, Pomegranates are um, symbolic of multiplicity, but you can see they're surrounded by a circular shape, the yellow circular shape, which is symbolic of unity. And we have multiples of those because Samkhya tells us, okay, Samkhya tell, tells us the universe is formed in pairs. The Dogen tell us that there are seven of those pairs. There are 14 universes, and they're made up of seven pairs of universes. They go together um, as a unit, as a set. Wow. Um, at the at the top of the pillar, the top of the right pillar, the, the sort of pyramid-like little shapes up there, wow. almost exactly mimic um, 
uh, carvings that were found at the Scarabray village that nobody knows what they represent. But uh, you see the same figure on one uh, above the um, the handbag shapes at, on the Gobekli Tepe pillar. There, to me, no, I'm sorry, not above the handbag shapes. They're above the. There's a vulture with its wing extended and a ball sitting on the end of the wing. This is the concept of um, a solstice being represented. Um, There's a whole lot in here, isn't there? Yeah, totally. Yeah, those scratchings to me represent a method of counting the days between solstices, solstices and equinoxes. Now, if we go back to the geometry that we drew with the east-west line that goes through the center of, okay, the east-west line that we marked from the, um, the two points across the circle, if we were to mark those points every morning and every evening, if every day we, we consistently went out and marked those two points and drew the line um, across the circle, we would see that at the equinox, it passes through the stick in the center of the circle. In other words, it gives us visibility on when the equinox happens. Farmers need that. Um, and they could track that line. They would see it moving progressively further away from the stick till they get to the solstice, progressively back to the stick to the equinox, and then continue on to the next extreme of the next solstice. They would be able to count the days and know exactly how many days there were in a year and how many days there were between solstices and equinoxes. They'd be able to predict when the equinox was going to happen, when the solstice was going to happen. They need this to control planting of crops, for one thing. But there's a more subtle thing going on with that same, okay, that's the oscillation I'm talking about of a dipole. There's a more subtle thing going on with that geometry. I said that it for Buddhism it represents how space emerges. But it also reconciles concepts of time because the way, okay, we experience linear time that is represented by the sundial that I talked about. During the daylight hours, you can, you can watch the shadows move and you can tell time by it. You have a ready-made clock. Right. You can't do that at night because the sun's not out. Right. But at night, what they're doing is they're telling time by conceptualizing the stars as constellations that are spaced approximately 1,000 uh, miles apart from our perspective. They, these constellations are configured to rise one per hour. So at night, you can tell the time by watching the constellations rise above the horizon. You know what hour it is by which constellation is sitting there. What the outlook is, is that time, okay, Einstein said that time is the fourth dimension. But actually, all of these concepts simplify if instead we think of time as the first dimension. That time in its native mode is an oscillation, just like consciousness is. And what the dynamic of the spinning energy does, the angular momentum that creates that center point and the circle around it, that dynamic evokes vectors because as the energy spins, um, time, uh, mass gets formed and time slows down. And as a consequence of that, you get, resistance, uh, you get resonance and resistance. And at each of the points of resonance and resistance, you get a vector that's emitted perpendicularly to the spinning energy. The center of those vectors sort of fan, uh, fan out like a fan. There are seven of them. And it's like if you had the ribs of a fan, these are what these vectors are like sitting perpendicular to the spinning energy. The centermost of those ribs is our material arrow of time. The reason we, have a, we experience linear time is because that oscillation that the non-material is experiences time evokes that vector, which is our material time. And so the geometry that the Buddhist is setting out not only shows us how space emerges, it also shows us how to reconcile concepts of time between the non-material and the material. It's showing us how time emerges. Well, that's really fascinating, Laird. Wow. 
<laughs> it's it's a lot of stuff I know, and it took took years to come around to the perspective of what is it they're really saying here. Um, when you boil it down, it comes down to a handful of dynamics of energy that are are automatic with energy. These are these are root principles of physics. This is the way energy behaves. When you have two different different qualities of energy, just like if you have two different streams of water at different speeds or different temperatures, when they come together, they spin automatically. And when they spin, when the energy spins, it automatically does a couple of things. First, it evokes resonance and resistance, and that resistance is mass. But when you get mass, you're also slowing down time. Okay. So... Okay, so the universe we're living in is a universe that has quite a bit of mass in it, and the process of producing that mass has progressively slowed down our time frame. We can see that because, you know, the astronomers are all confused. They can't explain how is it that it looks to us like the rate at which the universe is expanding is speeding up. What could possibly cause that to speed up? What they don't understand is that during the same period of time that the universe doubled in size, the ratio between mass and energy also doubled. In other words, the expansion of the universe has a one-to-one -one relationship to the conversion of energy to mass. Wow. <clears throat> uh, okay, now, the reason that happens is... is that, that implies some very interesting, subtle things. Um, yeah. I, how to explain this. Um, when you slow down the time frame of somebody, it has a really weird effect. We can see that there's a relationship between how big the universe looks and how much mass there is. That as you're converting energy to mass, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between doing that and the universe getting bigger but you also have time frame slowing. At root, what's going on is the space is not really expanding. All that's happening is that our time frame is slowing down progressively and we don't know it. And so the astronomers look at this and they do their measurements and they don't see that what's causing their confusion isn't a speeding up of the expansion of space. They're seeing the effect of the slowing down of their own time frame. It's like if you're sitting on a train and there's a second train next to you and one, at going the same speed and one of the trains speeds up. It's not immediately clear to the passengers on your train whether your train just slowed down or the other train just speeded up. It's the same, same effect. And yeah, so I see. I know, yeah, I know what you're at, talking about. At, at the bottom, okay, at the bottom reality if space isn't really expanding, then there may actually be no space between objects in native mode. There are maybe very, very, um, really doesn't matter what the actual distance is, it might not be changing. Um, well, one of the ways to picture this is, I live three hour drive from New York City. I'm three hours north of New York City. Now, there are many different ways that I could choose to go to New York City. I could walk, I could ride a skateboard, I could ride a bicycle, I could um, you know, take a motorcycle, I could hop in a car, I could ride on a bus, I could take a train, I could hop on a jet plane to go from here to New York City. And the amount of time it takes me to get there would quicken depending on which mode I use. It takes me longer to go walking than it does if I'm flying on a jet plane. But the actual distance doesn't change. It's always the same number of miles. But to an outside observer who is tracking how long it took me to get from point A to point B, if they weren't paying attention, they might imagine that I was getting from A to B quicker because the distance had shortened, not because my speed had quickened. Wow. This, and uh, all this stuff just goes through your mind like crazy, like it's nothing, huh? You know, um, well, it, it, 
it, it's been a long process. It's been a 20 year process, actually more than that, 25 year process, making sense of what all these little pieces add up to. And a lot of it, I was confused, completely confused. Why does the Egyptian hieroglyphic language have two glyphs, different glyphs, to represent the concept of time? Well, now I understand. One of it represents the oscillation of time, the way it is um, experienced non-materially, and the other represents linear time, the way we experience it. Wow. It's the little, pit, little bits that don't make sense that are the things that eventually, after a very long time, you get perspective on, and suddenly, wow, you understand what somebody meant. Yeah, and I get that, now, too, like, who, with... with and, and, I don't know why, like I am real familiar with Western symbolism, but now that you're talking about all this stuff, you know that anyways, I don't want to interrupt you. You got to do a book on Kabbalism. No, go Seriously. You got to like, there's so much in the Kabbalah. Well, it's rich. I, I think you should just like, do no, a I, book I know totally that it focused is. On it. I, I think that we get to that, um, through comparison, as I said, there are, there are conventions in Kabbalism that I'm not um, qualified to honor or to observe. Sure. And so for me to take a Kabbalist concept that's, that's understood one way in Kabbalism and write about it as if I it's a Kabbalist perspective um, goes against the grain for me. What I'd rather do is say, here's the Kabbalist concept. Now here's how the Dogen and the Buddhists and other groups understand it. And I've already done that with seeking the primordial with okay. key, key concepts. Um, the Dogen try to represent a fundamental difference in structure between the non-material and the material universe. And the way the Dogen describe it, they, they have a myth that's trying to express the idea that that there's a difference in structure. Um, conceptually, the way they see it, if, you, if they were to draw it out, the difference takes the form of the two different kinds of sushi. With one sushi, you have seaweed, which is like a membrane that wraps around the outside of the spiral. With the other sushi, you have seaweed wrapping around the inside of the spiral of rice. That, to me, is the fundamental difference between structures non-materially and materially. In one case, light wrap around, wraps around mass. That's non-material. On the material side, mass wraps around light. Now, the Dogen myth that's used to describe that, they talk about eight ancestors. These represent eight stages of the formation of that spiral. And... In the example they give, they say that those eight ancestors descended in order. Descending is a concept that applies to becoming more massive. Those eight ancestors descended in sequence. But when they got to the, seventh, the turn of the seventh ancestor to descend, the eighth ancestor stepped in front of him and descended first and made the seventh ancestor so angry that he killed the eighth ancestor. Now, the French anthropologist who this myth was being t reported to kept asking why. Why did the eighth ancestor, the seventh ancestor, kill the eighth? Why do you have to kill the eighth ancestor? What, why, why did this happen? And finally, the priest who was giving him the story admitted, well, honestly, nobody was really killed. This is just an example to illustrate a dynamic that compared to the non-material non structures, there's a difference in sequence materially from hap what happens non-materially, and that's all they're trying to illustrate. In Kabbalism, they illustrate the, exact, the very same concept, the idea that there is a difference, fundamental difference in the structure of the material universe compared to the non-material. It's described as a flaw. The, um, it's represented as if it's a flaw, but it's not really a flaw. It's just a difference. And in Kabbalism, the way it's represented is they say that during the sequence of high holy days in Judaism, that Adam and Eve were not supposed to consummate their relationship until a particular day. They were supposed to wait until um, after sunset on Friday night to consummate their relationship. But they rushed it and, and, and did that sooner. And it's because they 
they did it out of sequence, that there is an inherent flaw in the material universe that has to be rectified. And Kabbalism says that will be rectified in approximately 6,000 years. Well, the, the current Hebrew year, I think, is 5779, which is approximately 6,000 years. There are all sorts of indications that, like that that we right now have just passed the bottom of the energetic cycle that we have just passed the point where the universe that we're living in is as, as material as it's going to get, and we're now starting back up the other side where it's going to progressively become less and less material. Uh, really? I, okay. I missed a, yeah, I missed a point to explain that. This cycle of energy that goes between the universes isn't just um, shifting energy from one universe to the other, it's also shifting mass because we see on the material oh. side that energy converts to mass. Okay. So what you're really doing is you're causing one universe, the one that's getting less massive, you're causing its time frame to quicken and you're causing the other universe's time frame to slow down. Um, and so I, it re I got to take a small break, Laird, and I have to play just okay. a couple of sponsorship commercials here. I really want to... Go ahead. I got to finish up on that point that you just talked about. We'll be right back with Laird Scranton. The book that I have from Laird is his newest one, Ganesh, the Scientific Symbolism of a Hindu God. We'll be right back. Stay with us. face all over the place we're online 24 7 24 7 you're listening to the hottest internet station boy there it's Gigi from shift happens here to say thank you so much for choosing to hang out with us during these times of quarantine no matter what this crazy world throws our way you can count on us to always be here for you right here on the fringe fm the wholesome sexy radio Hi, this is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world. And we also conduct interviews with authors, investigators, psychics, and mediums. Real people, real stories, real fear. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. See you then. My name is Jake. I'm from Billings, Montana, and I am a Void Walker. Hey, Joe Root. Thanks for lighting the void. This is Janine in the bluegrass of Kentucky, and I am a Void Walker. What's up, guys? This is Damien from San Marcos, Texas, and I'm a Void Walker. I listen to the show to keep myself aligned with the world. Hi, this is Laura, a.k.a. Laura Lavender. I'm from Las Vegas, and I listen to Lighting the Void because it helps me understand some of the strangest experiences I've had. So thanks for all that you do and for always being there for us, Joe. Lighting the Void is proud to announce Mind and Magic's Protection and Defense Course for protection from magical and psychic attacks. This is not a joke. Magic practitioners are on the rise, and with that comes attacks from baneful or black magicians that try to harm or hurt others for their own selfish reasons. If you are not a believer in psychic attacks, then this isn't for you. If you are, and you want the power to defend yourself and your family and home, then I highly suggest you grab Freighter Xavier's Protection and Defense Course. In this course, you will learn how to tell if you are under attack from a natural natural source or if an individual is attacking you. The four forms of curses and attacks. How to remove self-imposed curses. The correct way to cleanse your home from negativity or malevolent entities. How to make your own holy water. What you should always keep near or under your bed. Herbs that banish negativity and promote purity. The most powerful banishing rituals on the planet. And for those that seem to want to harm you the most. How to put your enemies in a hell pit of their own making. You can also learn protection against shadow people and other entities. Or are you just in a bad planetary alignment? Even how to get rid of an enemy using a tic-tac box. It does not matter what your faith or belief is. This will work. Click the banner on the website at lightingthevoid.com or go to lightingthevoid.com forward slash Xavier.
listening to Lighting the Void. The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at 501-777-5631. Well, this conversation has gotten just as deep as I thought it would with uh, Laird. And I had another great epiphany. It's like, this has got to be the second or third time. Um, but you were talking about something. Well, last time you were on, man, it was super deep. Uh, but th- you were talking about the reversal of the realms. And I really wanted you to finish that thought. But I had to play that commercial. I was behind. Uh, but go ahead. So that That's fine. Okay, so we have this mass, and then there's energy that's going to convert to mass on the material side, scrolling back and from one universe to the other, and then back again. That cycle I equate to the yuga cycle of, of Buddhism. In fact, that almond-shaped gateway we were talking about, the Dogen referred to as the yu seed. It compares to the shape of a millet seed called the yu seed. The Dogen syllable ga refers to concepts of temporality, temporality of time. They say past, present, and as if in a story, which is an interesting way to think of the future. So been, yuga is literally the cycle of energy, the cycle of time, cycle of, of, of time and energy that passes through the seed, which is this gateway. So... What happens is that at, by the point that we're at in the cycle, which is at the bottom of the cycle, our time frame is as slow as it's going to get. Non-materially, the time frame is as quick as it's going to get. Now, if you've ever seen time-lapse footage of traffic on a highway, say at night, you realize that what originally looks like um, individual cars when you speed it up fast enough, it doesn't look like individual cars anymore. It looks like a stream of light or a stream of cars. Right. Yeah. It looks like waves. The reason the quantum world looks like waves to us is because its time frame is ultra quick. This is a, a function of Einstein's theory of relativity that nobody pays attention to. Things are happening ultra quickly at the quantum level. When an act of perception happens... Heisenberg says that if you if you have a structure that's small enough that that um, conceptually I mean quantum small enough you know if it if it's unmassive enough that the the act of perception has to disturb it. Well, if you get down to the level of waves, which are virtually massless, and that's the same thing as having no acceleration. The act of perception can only do one thing. It can only accelerate the wave. And when it accelerates the wave, it's like stepping on the brake of a car that's good when you're driving very quickly. When you step quickly on the brake of a car to, to brake faster than you should, the car starts to shake and vibrate. And the same thing happens with, with the wave when it's perceived. That vibration causes it to spin and pivot. And the consequence of that spinning and pivoting is all the stuff, all, the formation of all the structures of matter that I'm talking about. It sets off a chain reaction that slows down time frame and makes it look to us as if simply by changing the time frame, simply by slowing from ultra quick time frame to our time frame, you change the perspective from looking like waves to looking like particles. There's no no real big mystery going on here. There are, there are some root dynamics of energy and that shift in time frame. Now the same thing happens Okay, if we were to imagine what happens with that act of per, per, imagine what that act of perception looks like from the point of view of the quantum wave, that, to my way of thinking, is precisely what a black hole looks like to us. A black hole implies that there's another domain whose time frame is as much slower of, than ours as ours is of the quantum world, to whom we look like waves. They've done Whoa. measurements. Scientists have done measurements of entangled particles and discovered that interactions between two (laughs) electrons that are entangled occur 10,000 times as fast as interactions between electrons um, in our normal perception. 
So what we're dealing with is, fundamentally what we're dealing with is differences in quickness of time frame. Now during that cycle of energy, that scrolling energy that goes from one universe to the other, if you think about it, you realize that there's got to be a point at the center of that process. Imagine instead of having energy scrolling from one universe to another, you have sand shifting from one globe of an hourglass to the other globe. There's a point in the middle where the amount of sand in the top part of the hourglass is the same as the amount of sand in the bottom part. Right, yeah. At that, at that point, the time frames of the two universes should equalize. At that point, because the time frames are equal, theoretically it's possible to move from one universe to the other. That's why the equinox is so important to the ancient cultures, because that equinox, which, which for us represents the era of Scarabray on Orkney, it's around somewhere between 3600 and 3200 BC. If we, if we judge that the Hebrew calendar was um, established just about the point of that equinox, then it was 3779 years ago. No, I'm sorry, 5779 years ago, almost 6,000 years. So that puts us in the realm of around 3600 BC. In that era, it should have been possible, like passing through an airlock, it should have been possible to move from one universe to the other without any resistance. So what do you think... And but didn't you say that that we're? I could have swore I heard you say that you believe that we're coming up on that time now, where it's starting well, no, to change. We're at over. The, we're, no, we're no, we're okay. That time is the equinox. Okay, if we think of this as a great year, right? I'm seeing the equinox point of the great year as being 3600 BC. We're at a solstice right now. We're at the solstice. Um, there's a descending half cycle where a universe becomes more massive and then an ascending cycle where it becomes less massive. We're just now starting up the side where we become less massive. And um, 6,000 years from now, we'll be back at the equinox again. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why I thought I heard that for some reason. But that that's all right. But that is, well, we had a guest on the other night, and I'll just make this real quick. That he, he came up, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but he came up with a term, his own term, he's a physicist called bijective physics, where a black hole uh -huh. has, on one end, it pretty much swallows all the, all of mass and matter and energy, and on the other end, it spits out what's called a jet, which is are just the fundamental like elements of life, uh, just the pure right. fundamental elements of life. Would that make sense based on what you're saying or no? Well, yes, because it's it's essentially the same dynamic. For me, it's a parallel dynamic to an act of perception causing um, the time frame to slow of a, a wave, matter in its wave-like state. That's a, what happens with a black hole is that time, the closer you get to the black hole, the more time slows down. They understand that anything that passes into the black hole is experiencing slower and slower and slower and slower time frame. That's exactly the same effect. Um, at the next level up from us that happens at the next level down from quantum world to us. So yes, essentially you're feeding the energy that's going to create the equivalent of material structures in that domain. Man, that is, uh, that is, uh, that is super impressive what you know about all this stuff. I told Lair during the break that, he should do a podcast. Like, I'm sure you get that all the time. Like, come on, man, just give us more info, you know? Like, just keep it coming. Keep it coming. And, uh, you, you know, I don't think you, you did make a point where you're like, hey, uh, you have to learn where to focus your energy on certain things. And Tim Ferriss talks about that too. He's like, find out what you're good at and stop trying to fix what you're not good at and focus on what you're good at and you'll be more successful, you know? And you're good well, at I like research. the idea of. I like a, the idea of a conference. Uh, there have been a number of times where I, where I had an evening in um, San Diego one evening um, after presentations in the conference. I had tried to arrange for a room in the hotel everybody was staying in to hold sort of a question and answer session and let the, the presenters of the conference just sit there and shoot the breeze with the attendees because there's a lot of value to everybody in doing that. But 
the hotel um, and the runners of the conference wouldn't arrange for the room for me to do that. So um, during the presentations, a couple of the attendees had said, would you mind meeting us in the lobby of the hotel around 8 o'clock? We just had a couple of things we wanted to ask you. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to do that. So we get there. And by 11 o'clock at night, we have the entire lobby filled with people who are sitting around asking questions, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is great. I don't blame them. So um, I uh, also um, had organized, uh, uh, deliberately organized a day's conference myself um, a couple of years back in April at Vassar College, which is about halfway between here and New York City, um, charging the minimum that I could. I think it was ended up being like $20 a person to come for the day and advertise it on Facebook. And I figured um, if we get enough people to to cover the cost of the of the room, and the room wasn't very expensive. I think it was like a $300 rental to the room. Uh, we could bring our own coffee and our, our own um, uh, snacks and things like that. So it cost almost nothing to put on a day's conference, and it could open it up to people for almost no money. So that's something I would like to do again anytime. That's something I really wanted to do with John Anthony West, but he got sick before we had a chance to do it. Yeah, you know what? That was a that was a. I think everybody that was a bittersweet thing for everybody. I was actually going to start helping him and his. Uh, I think it was his buddy that had a, also had a last name was Roop. He wanted me to help him with his marketing stuff, and I was like, "Oh, cool! I'm going to yeah, get to help it, John play, Anthony play West." Roop, yeah. You know. Um, yeah. And then he got uh, sick. At that time, Clay Clay Roop was dating um, John's daughter Zoe, and he took it upon himself to organize a GoFundMe. I think we raised. Uh, $110,000 to cover cancer treatments for John. Well, uh, Laird, it's been an absolute, we, our show is over. We don't do three hours anymore. Aren't you glad? At least not for now. Right. So, um, <laughs> well, our, I'd, be, I'd be happy to come back on and talk again at what, anytime the mood strikes you and yeah. we don't necessarily have to have the topic. We just open it up to people's questions and I'll try to address what people want to hear. Yeah, absolutely. The next time what we'll do is we'll make you go through the whole tarot deck. No, I'm just playing. No, we won't do that. It'd be crazy <laughs> yeah. if we did though, right? If he made you go through the whole tarot deck and tell me what you see in this card. Like, what am I, a monkey? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But no, like, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, thanks for being a, a great interviewer. Oh, you're very welcome. And hey, is your website is it currently under development? Like LairdScranton dot com? No. You're still working on actually, it? Or? Actually, that was never my that was never my site. That was a fan site. Ah. Uh, somebody um, took the domain name and tried to sell it back to me. They wanted oh me my to gosh. pay them to maintain the site, and uh, so now it's sort of a, a dead site. So what what which what's the proper link? Because that's the one I put up on the yeah. flyer. Well, there, there isn't one. I don't have a website. If people want to find me, the easiest place is probably on Facebook. Okay. And then from there, we can communicate by Facebook message. If if that's not enough, then I'll give an email address out, and they can contact me by email. Fantastic. Well, yeah, fantastic. Thank. Sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no problem at all. Thanks for coming on, Laird. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. All right, guys, go grab the book. Ganesh, the scientific symbol of a Hindu god. Always cool talking to Laird. We got to roll out of here like ASAP. Uh, thanks to the patrons. Thanks to the Fringe FM chat. Pacho, love you guys. We'll see you guys tomorrow night. Same time, same channel. The Secret Teachings with Ryan Gables coming up live on the Fringe FM. See you tomorrow night. Good night.